So yes, as Vanessa said, I am going to give a talk about hunting bugs. So this is a picture of the ENYAC, which was the first general purpose computer. And you will notice a few things from this uh, photo. One is that the computers were huge. <laughs> this is a very large computer. Um, and um, those are women and they are programming the computer. Back in the day, uh, programming was all done in hardware. So they are uh, programming the computer by moving wires around. The ENYAC women were among the first coders to discover that software never works right the first time and that a programmer's main work really is to find and fix the bugs. This is from a fabulous New York Times Magazine article, The Secret History of Women in Coding, which I highly recommend. Um, hopefully it's not behind a paywall, I don't know. Um, but in case you have ever wondered, <laughs> women are definitely capable of coding and we're the first coders um, primarily until uh, the men discovered that it was kind of fun and then they kind of pushed us out a little bit and we've been trying to get back since then. <laughs> um, but what is a bug? A bug, um, well, back in the day, <laughs> a bug was a moth. Um, bug is actually a term that's been used since the early uh, 1700s, I think, for anything that's, that's in a... Uh, hardware or software, um, an unexpected problem. So this piece of paper right here is in fact, one of the first bugs found in software, well, hardware really. Um, and this was Grace Hopper's team. If anybody is familiar with Grace Hopper, they're the ones that found the, found the moth in the relay. So I'm sure some of you have seen this far side cartoon before. And I'm wondering, you know, is this a bug? You can imagine somebody filing a bug report and saying, I can't open this door. <laughs> um, and we would say, oh, this is just user error. Um, but I do want you to think twice about user error because sometimes your documentation is actually leading people astray. Now, in this particular example, the, the documentation seems to pretty clearly say pull. Um, but you should also think about whether the users find your software sort of intuitive. Do they automatically go into something and know what to do, or do they always do the wrong thing? You know, if you're getting lots of bug reports that are user error, think about why that is. But we're here for hunting bugs. So I'm going to go through some basic steps for troubleshooting. Uh, we're going to dig in a little bit into code and error messages, and then I'll give you more tools for troubleshooting. So you can imagine that you're in a company and you receive a bug report and it is your job to go and find the bug. So what are you going to do? What are your steps you're going to do? Um, the first thing you should do is verify the bug. And this can happen either by the ideal situation is that you can go and reproduce the bug. Um, sometimes this involves uh, going to the logs instead to see what's going on with the logs. And I'm gonna stop and give a PSA um, here that you should check on your logs because there have been so many times when we have gone to troubleshoot a problem, looked in the logs and discovered either um, they're not logging what you think they should be logging, uh, not helping you, or um, that they're in the wrong place, they're, you can't find them. Um, so just PSA, check on your logs. Um, and it's tempting at this point, once you've verified your bug, to go ahead and touch your code and start playing around to see what's going on. But I encourage you to, to hold off a little bit and instead to write an integration test that fails. And you might ask, why do I need to test? Um, and I did this search on, on news to about software bugs and I got like 19 million results. Um, and most of them are bugs that 
you know, have caused serious problems. Um, they can cause problems where companies lose millions of dollars or when even injury and um, death in a couple of cases. And, and of course, I don't want you to be lured into the exciting project that could banish most of them because I'm sure most of you realize that there very rarely is a uh, quick fix to anything. <laughs> So I know, keep your eye on that, maybe it'll happen. But uh, in the meantime, I recommend testing. Um, the first link here is a very good overview of why testing is important. Um, and then the second link is one that um, teaches you how to do uh, test-driven development using Django. And I recommend both of those. And my slides will be available. So all of these links and whatnot will be available to you after the talk. Um, so why is it important to write the test first? I'm sure that many of you have had the experience of writing a test that you're expecting to fail and have it pass or vice versa. Tests can be really hard to read. They can be really hard to figure out what's going on. They're important, but they're hard. Um, and so if you write the test beforehand and you see it failing, then you can be fairly sure that once you get it pass, passing, that you've actually fixed your bug and that you haven't hopefully created another bug or, uh, or not fixed your bug and just did the wrong test. So then the last step is fix the bug so the test pass. So again, steps for troubleshooting, verify the bug, write a test that fails, and then fix the bug so the test pass. Now, of course, the hard one right here is the fix the bug. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit more about how you actually fix the bug. And before we can really do that, we need to dig in a little bit into code and error messages. Um, I encourage you to try to, to make sure that you understand your code um, and, and to play around with the code, either in the interpreter or the Python tutor has a very fun interface where you can sort of have a visualization of, of what you're doing. And once upon a time when we started programming, we thought of these, you know, scripts that are one one file and they seem to have a beginning and an end and you can kind of step through and maybe there's some loops or some if statements, but everything felt fairly, fairly contained. But of course, code doesn't always look like that. I, I was gonna try and build a little animation of how complicated code gets, um, but I didn't have time for that. And I thought instead, I talk a little bit about chicken pot pie. And uh, chicken pot pie is very popular in my house. Um, so I, I make it quite a bit. And one thing that happens when you make chicken pot pie is you go to the recipe for chicken pot pie and it says, okay, you do this, you do this, you do this, and then go to this page and um, you need to make the, the pie crust. And then you come back and then it says, okay, now you need to make cream chicken. And when you make the cream chicken, you need to make it the version, especially for, you know, the pot pie and then come back. And, and a lot of code is like this, where you get sent off to other places, but it's even more complicated because you get sent off to other places and then off to other places. And then sometimes you come back and then, and pretty soon the, the code just looks like spaghetti and it's really hard to follow. Um, which is why it is very important to understand how the stack works, because this is a good way of seeing what's going on in your code. So let's talk a little bit about the stack. So the stack is a list of the things you have started but not finished. So if we are making a cake, we might be in the middle of adding some flour to our batter, which is the middle of the make batter step. And that is part of the make cake step. So I started at the bottom on purpose because this is how uh, stack traces work as well. And your very bottom is gonna be the thing that you're right in the middle of right now. Um, and the thing above it is gonna be sort of the bigger picture of what you're doing. It's, a, it's the step that you were in the middle of when you came to this step. And then above that and so on and so forth. And again, I 
going back to the same website, that um, the visualizations on this really can help you to understand how, how the stack works and how um, memory works as well in Python. So the stack trace, also called the traceback, is simply the stack as soon as something goes wrong. So you can imagine this being a trace pack you might get from your baking cake. Um, and there's a lot of stuff here, but a lot of this, all of this file stuff right here, um, is just telling you where in, where in the files the code is. And if we get rid of that, we can see that it's just the same stack that we saw before. We were in the middle of adding flour, which was in the middle of making batter, which was in the middle of make cake. Um, and then that's when we discovered that we didn't have any flour. So always start at the bottom of the stack trace. The problem, the exception is always at the bottom in Python. Um, and the code that, it, that caused it is often directly above it. So here's another example. We have a name error. We start at the bottom, we have a name error. Name hello is not defined. We go up. Oh, yes, it seems likely that um, we meant to make this a string and forgot. Um, and indeed, if we look at the code, yes, that's what happened. So I don't want you to be intimidated by the size of the stack. The stack can get quite, quite large. Um, but all that means is that you've added sort of, sort of one more layer. So we can just add this add to stack function that calls our bad function. And now when we call add to stack, we have another line on our stack. But we haven't changed anything fundamental. Um, we still have the same error at the bottom and it's still located in the same place in bad function. We just have more stuff on top. Unfortunately, an error may only become apparent as the line at the bottom is executed. In other words, you might not know that something went wrong until much later. So if we go back to our cake uh, example, and we think about um, making a cake, if we were to forget the uh, baking powder while we were making the cake, the batter doesn't look any different. You can't tell that you've forgotten the baking powder by looking at the batter. You'll only notice it much later when you pull it out of the oven and it didn't rise. And it's sometimes the same with code where you have an error at the bottom and you look up here and you say, well, there's nothing inherently about num divided by 10 that says that this is a stir. Um, so you're not really sure necessarily where the error happened. So if you look at the code, yeah, return num divided by 10. This is of course a very simplified example, uh, what you can fit on a slide. Um, but the, there's nothing here that says that anything is wrong. And you could think, oh, maybe I need to add checking or whatever, but, but maybe this really isn't where the problem is. And so you can go back and you say, okay, well, where were we when we made that call? We were in add to stack. So let's look at that. So if we look at add to stack, and this was the line where things went wrong. So what was happening right above that? Well, we were getting my num from bad function. Well, what's bad function doing? So we can go in and we can look at bad function. Oh, bad function is changing our number, our integer into a string. Clearly that's not what we wanted. And this is where the real problem is in bad function. But of course, bad function isn't in this stack anywhere. But we were able to use the stack to go and figure out where the problem was. Now, you might've noticed from this example that, um, that I'm not using type hinting here. And mostly it was because I wanted to make uh, everything very clear. Um, but now I want to show you what this looks like with some type hints in it. And now it becomes a little bit more clear, but more importantly, if you were to run my pie on this, my pie would pick up that you are in fact trying to divide 
a string with the number without you ever having to run the code. You can just run my Pi and it says, oh, this doesn't work. Um, so one of your tools for troubleshooting, or I should say preventing trouble, is um, using type hints in MyPy. So if you don't use that currently, I recommend looking into it. Um, so now let's look at another stack trace. This one is so ugly, it doesn't even fit in my screen here. Um, we have at the bottom our error and maybe where the error is coming from, but we have this thing in the center that says during handling of the above exception, another exception occurred. What does that mean? Why is that there? So let's look at this code. Ah, did things in wrong order. Nice. Okay, <laughs> so if we look at this code, um, we see that the problem that we saw in the bottom was this print greeting plus does not work. It was trying to combine what was not a string with a string and it failed. Um, but let's go back and see what the other problem was. It says during handling of the exception, another exception occurred. Type error can only con catenate stir and not in to stir. And that is in line three in bad function. So we have two places where we were getting an error. And that happened because this code right here is in the accept block. So it was trying to do print high plus greeting. That did not work. So it went to the exception and that also did not work. So that is how we ended up with those two exception blocks. And what I would say about that is if you come across this, too much, um, you need to pay attention to both errors. So clearly you need to fix what's going wrong in the accept block because you don't want your accept to, but also think about was this supposed to go into the accept block? What's going on here? Is this really what I'm trying to accept? Um, so pay attention to both errors, um, but again, you know that both of the errors should be fairly easy to find. The one is at the very bottom. The other one is going to be above the dur during handling of the above exception. Um, so I'm going to take a moment here to read this. Um, so some best practices with exception. Um, one, avoid this construction if you can keeps trying to do my dictionary. Um, accept exception accepts everything. But presumably, when you are trying to do something, there is one thing that you're worried about happening and that you know how to deal with. Sometimes there's more than one, and Python will let you do multiple accept blocks. Um, but you want to be very specific about what you're trying to catch. There are exceptions to this, where you have a web server or something that's long running that you don't want to you know, fall over sideways because you forgot a string. Um, but in that case, you want to make sure that you are logging and that you're checking the logs to make sure that things are not happening that you're not paying attention to that could cause problems later. Um, and the other thing that I just want to uh, point out is that your try blocks should be very, very small. You should only be putting in the try block code that you know how to deal with if it goes wrong and that you know that that's where the problem is. Okay, moving on. Um, you will all be happy to know that error messages have improved in Python. So if you've been struggling with error messages, I definitely recommend checking out 3.10. Um, and there's a link down here that goes through some of the improvements, um, but I highly recommend using the new version to get the new error messages. Okay, but when we started, we had a bug report and we created a failing test. So I've gone through a lot of stuff about understanding your code and what errors are and exceptions are and how to look at the stack trace and that kind of thing, but how do we actually um, find this error. So we're going to talk a little bit about some more tools for troubleshooting. 
And I wanted to start with the scientific method. I don't know how many people are familiar with it, but this is a way that scientists go about answering questions that they want to know the answer to. Um, so they want to know, you know, how does a bug do whatever they're doing? Um, and so they, they sort of cycle through this method. They observe, ask questions, do some research, come up with a guess on what's going on, um, do some experiments, and then analyze the data, report their conclusions, figure out if their hypothesis was correct or not, um, and then go in the circle again. And I think that this is something that we can learn from. I think that we can also do a similar thing, and it helps to very to isolate the problem and to sort of think clearly about what's going on. So you might have a bug report or an exception. You do some research, try and figure out what's going on. You make a guess about what you think is going on. You make sure that you have tests in place, um, and then you play around and see what happens. Um, you look at the data. Did you manage to get rid of the bug or not? And if you didn't get rid of the bug, if you didn't find the bug, um, what have you learned? What did you notice about what you did? What's left to check? Um, and so you go on the circle again. And, and so one of the main things about this method is that you should change one thing at a time. If you change a bunch of things at a time, um, often you don't know what, which one was the actual problem. You don't know if you should revert some of your changes. Um, if you don't fix the bug, you have a whole bunch of changes and <laughs> you're not sure, you know, okay, are some of these going to contribute? So I recommend changing one thing at a time to make sure that you um, understand which, what each step is doing. Um, reduce the code to its essence. So think about when you're trying to troubleshoot code, think about whether you can pull the code out from where it is. So I have this example. I was trying to, um, I was using fast API and we were trying to load stuff from a config file. And we were working on fast API in a container and um, we had G unicorn running and um, we had lots going on. And I, took a look at this file and I said, oh, you know what? Fast API isn't in this file at all, actually. I can just look at this file. I don't need all of that other machinery in my way um, in order to figure out what's going on. So I reduced it down to this and I couldn't get my config to load. And I did a little investigation and I realized um, that Pydantic is using .env. And so I said, oh, well, I wonder if .env is getting what it needs. And so I looked to see, you know, what's in settings, what's in .env. And .env was working. It was not a problem with .env. So something was stopping me from getting it into the settings. And at this point, I, actually, it might've been a little early. I don't remember exactly. <laughs> the process, but I reached out to some other people and I said, what is going on? Um, and we realized that I had a variable here, but my variable here did not match the variables in my settings or in my M file. And so in retrospect, I should have realized, oh, okay, you need to have a class variable that reflects that, otherwise it can't load it in. Um, but I wasn't thinking about, you know, classic Python. I was thinking about why isn't my settings getting into, I did what it said. And if you look in the documentation, there's just three dots under the class settings. So you don't actually realize um, just by looking at that, that you actually need to have everything matching. So then when I added in my config, it worked like magic. And I bring this up for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that um, even after you know 20 years of programming, sometimes things just slip your mind and you don't think about them. And 
it's important that other people understand that, that everybody misses things. And if you talk about things and try and um, relate to other people and what problems they're having with the code, um, everybody learns. So, And then the other thing I wanted to bring up with that particular example is the very first thing I did after I realized what was going on was I went and I wrote down in our, you know, notes, programmer notes, um, make sure that if you add an environmental variable to the file, you also add it to this class. So making sure that other people aren't going to make the same mistake you are. If you come upon some code that you don't understand and you spend some time trying to figure out what's going on and you figure out what's going on, go ahead and write a little tidbit about how you figured out or what you figured out. If people find the code and understand the code, they will just ignore your comments. And if they see the code and don't understand, maybe your comments will help. So documenting and comments um, can help with future bug finding. Betty Snyder realized that if you wanted to debug a program that wasn't running correctly, it would help to have a breakpoint, a moment when you could stop a program midway through its run. To this day, breakpoints are a key part of the debugging process. This is also from that same article. And I want to give a little shout out to Betty for helping us on our way. <laughs> um, because I found that uh, the debugger is very crucial. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Python debugger, PDB. And you might say, well, but print works. And it's true. I've used print a lot. Um, but sometimes it's slow, um, as in your call, if your test is making a bunch of network calls or hitting a database, you know, it takes a couple seconds. And if you have to keep printing new things and figuring out new things and doing it over and over, it can take a while. Um, if you're like me, you often print out a bunch of variables and don't think to put the name of the variable, and then you just see a bunch of data and you're like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> um, but I think the, the biggest problem with print is that when you go in and look at code, you can see exactly how you progress through the code. But you can't go backwards. You can't say, OK, I'm in this function. How might I have gotten here? it's not good for that. And this is where PDB can be very helpful. Um, and one of the useful commands in PDB is W, which stands for where. And if you look at this, the top one is W, the second one is trace back. Um, they're pretty much exactly the same. Little arrows on this one and some you know path stuff, but it's pretty much exactly the same. It's showing you where, what file, where you are, um, and exactly what called what. So you can use this information. Excuse me. So you're trying to figure out why your test isn't pass, isn't passing. You put a breakpoint in your code where you believe the test should pass through. And here's where it becomes important to kind of understand a little bit of the flow of your code, where things are supposed to be going. And often, so you find this code and you put in your set trace so that you can get into the PDB and you run your test. And often this works fine. You end up in your, in your function and you can look around. Um, you can use dir, which is very handy to figure out sort of what's behind a variable. Um, you can use basically anything that you would normally use in the interpreter. Um, and just look at variables, look at what's going on. Um, but sometimes you put that PDP statement in and you run your test and it just goes by and and the test fails and you don't know what happened and you wonder, well, why didn't it hit my breakpoint? Um, and in this case, I recommend um, leaving the breakpoint where it is. And unless you suddenly realize why, why your code didn't go through it um, and try a similar test. 
So I'm going to switch to a sports analogy here. Um, if you had a program um, that's getting stats on particular players, for example, um, maybe you're looking at the goalie and that keeps failing and you don't understand why. Well, maybe you want to change your data a little bit. Maybe you want to look at a different player on the same team or maybe a goalie on a different team or maybe a game that's different. Um, so just think about what can you change? What can you do differently about your test um, that might change the path where it's going through so that you end up hitting that same breakpoint? Uh, so here's an example of looking at W again. Um, and you can go up the stack. So if you were looking at return 10, you know, you hit, so you run your second test, you get into the D, the function that you thought the first one should be hitting. Why isn't the other one hitting it? You can go up the stack and you say, okay, well, it didn't hit here, but what if I go up here? Now I can see where the code, where the process was going. So maybe in this file, I will find, if I put a PDB statement, maybe then the other test will hit it. Or if I do here, maybe the other test will hit it. And again, you want to remember that this is the code, this add to stack, um, excuse me. So print divide by 10 is where this checkpoint is. Let's show that. Um, divide by 10 has this checkpoint um, and that's where it didn't hit. So you look at your code and you go up and you say, okay, now let's check bad stack, add to stack. Sorry, that's the file name, add to stack. So you look at add to stack. Well, here is where we, this is the function that has our PDB statement in. So maybe we check right above here and we put a breakpoint here. We run the first test again. Is it hitting there? You can keep going up the stack, looking to see what's going on in various places in the stack. Um, yeah, this is just an example of going, so you keep going up the stack and then you can put it, I spoke faster than my slides went. <laughs> so you put your import PDB here instead and see if you're, you can now use your original test and see if that gets you in. So all this to say that you're using the stack to go back and forth um, and compare things. What are things looking like in this test where things are going wrong versus this test where things are going right? What's the difference? Um, it is easier definitely easier when you look up the stack to find places where your code is. That's the easier place to put PDB statements. Um, you know where your code is, generally speaking. Um, outside libraries, um, when you put breakpoints there, you can often get swamped, mired in <laughs> all kinds of things that make no sense. Um, so I definitely recommend sticking the <coughs> PDB statements in your own code. Um, and I would always suspect your own code first. Um, occasionally you'll find an error in an imported library, um, but that's very rare. So as I say, no offense, but statistically speaking, it's probably your code. Try changing things, do a new test. Always do a fresh commit before you change anything. Um, hopefully you're using a version control system. If you don't know what that is, I highly recommend checking, looking it up. Um, you're looking to see what works, what doesn't work. Things like black pilot and flake eight can find mistakes in your code that you didn't even know you had. Um, black is primarily a formatter, but it makes it everything re much more readable and easier to, for other people to work on. Um, but Pylint and Flake 8 both are sort of comparing your code to PEP 8, seeing where things might not be right, and they will catch syntax errors and sometimes other errors as well. 
So I highly recommend using these in your CI CD pipeline or at least um, locally. Using your favorite search engine. Um, make sure that when you're copying and pasting into your search engine that you aren't using you know, your function names or the name of a file or something like this, because you're just more likely to get results that are pertinent to your error if you just limit it to the error and um, things that are not unique to your code. This one, the Python 3 one's not as crucial as it used to be. Once, you know, 10 years ago, if you put a Python error into a search engine, most of the top was all Python 2.7 and not necessarily helpful. So sometimes I still find it useful to put Python 3 in my search engine to make sure that I'm mostly getting Python 3 results. Um, understand what you find. Um, don't just blindly copy and paste stuff from the internet into your code. Um, not only because you might be, you know, copying something that's actually hazardous, um, but it's a lot easier later on to fix that same bug again if it comes up or to understand the code that you've written if you understand it the first time and you are implementing it correctly. Um, and even the professionals do it. This is a link to somebody who wrote down everything they Googled in a week as a professional developer. So that's to, to, <laughs> to give you reassurance that it is not weird to put everything in a search engine. <laughs> I like the, the uh, image of developers out there with little slingshots going around trying to find error bugs. Um, but yeah, you would definitely, Take advantage of a search engine. It was hell before we had search engines. Uh, debugging is like an onion. There are multiple layers to it. And the more you peel them back, the more likely you're going to start crying at inappropriate times. So I, I like to encourage people to think of, of bug hunting as sort of this game that you're playing where you're trying to track down this, this bug and you're trying to find it and um, you have all these tools. And, um, but sometimes it just gets really frustrating and you just <laughs> are wanting to start to cry at appropriate times. And so I definitely encourage taking a break occasionally. Um, it really, really helps to take your mind off of the problem the i want to call it the back of your mind but your unconscious mind will continue to work on the problem while you're out taking a walk taking a nap taking a shower whatever you do to sort of relax a little bit and often um, this is a much shorter <laughs> route to finding a solution than banging your head for hours and hours so if you if you find that you're just getting frustrated and you're not figuring out what's going on, highly recommend taking a break. Write everything down. I find this very useful as well. Um, not just um, so that you know you can ask for help later, but also because often just the act of writing things down helps you to realize what you haven't tried yet or what else could be causing it, something like this. Um, and I've had, I've had a colleague who said that they like to explain things to uh, their husband who is not tech at all, that trying to take a problem and strip it down to its essence so somebody who's not technical can understand it can also help to try and sort through what you haven't tried or what, what could be going on. <laughs> Um, people often talk about rubber ducking, which is simply just talking to an inanimate object like a rubber duck <laughs> and just explaining the problem out loud. So some people are oral, some people are written or like visual. So I like to write everything down. Other people like to talk. Um, so figure out what works best for you. Um, and don't forget to ask for help. And pie ladies in general, and I'm sure all of the groups here are always very willing to, to, uh, to help out. <laughs> um, and they will want to see a lot of the stuff that you've written down, um, what the call was, what you were 
what you were trying to do, what you have tried, that sort of thing. So asking for help. Um, and don't be afraid to share your code. Um, it's, it's a little traumatic, it's a little scary for sure, um, but it can be a great learning experience for both younger devs and devs that have been working in the industry for a long time. You can really learn a lot from each other. So don't be afraid to pair code, to, to ask for a code review, um, to talk to other developers. That's supposed to say for the win, but it got cut off. <laughs> Thank you. May you win and not the bug. And that is the link down here. I'll put it also in the chat. And then there's also, you can also find out how the real Monty Pythonistas bug hunt there. Let's see. So put this in the chat. And thank you all for listening. That's not it. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. This Thank was you. excellent. And the advice at the end is on point. I have tried everything that you recommended and I can attest it does work. So I am going to stop the recording.